So although I'm standing at the front, I'm not meant to be presenting everything. So I'm hoping that anybody with any experience or insight will have a chance to say their thing, not in terms of question and answer, but more in a sharing of information. This is a subject that we've been working on for years and years to try and get this monster up and running. So we're absolutely delighted that finally we have a chance to really deal with it and talk about it. So, Ego sum regina kitharum, I am queen of hearts. And you can see it it's written in the carving on the woodwork. So this is a bold claim that this old instrument is making. It's, it's in the National Museum of Ireland in Collins Barracks. So those of you who come on our field trip on Tuesday will see this, take the real my, thing. Take my and, show it from the and you can see it was made in 1621 in West Cork on the south of Ireland by Donoghue McTavy. East, East Cork. I was from East Cork. And we know he, we know he made it because he wrote his, na his name on it. You can see the inscriptions just here, running along, carved and gilded. It's an incredibly lush thing. It's a real art object. Can you see the paint on the animals? It's, it's, it's carved, it's coloured, it's incredibly vibrant and bright and happening and a very prestigious musical instrument. Unfortunately, it's in bits. And so, sorry this photo is fuzzy, but this is the best I had. This is. This is the, the cloying harp in Collins Barracks a few years ago on our field trip. And this is what you'll see on Tuesday when you come on the field trip. Can you see the two, what the two parts are? On the left is the four pillar of the harp, and on the right is the harmonic curve, or the neck of the harp with the tuning pins in. There is no sound box. So we don't have the sound box, the width, the length, the arrangement of shoes, completely gone. And has been gone for hundreds of years. So we only have these pieces left. Okay. This is a close-up of the central part of the coin heart. And what do you see that's a bit odd? Next to a five. Yeah, how many of you, the hearts that you're renting today, have that? Nobody. Okay. So this is, so this is very, this is, this, is the, this is the thing that instantly catches your eye with the cloying harp is it has this row of seven, actually, because there's five plus two extra holes. And then here's the main row. And the main row of strings is very close together, closer together than is normal. And there's lots more of them. So there are 47, no, 45 no. tuning pins in the main rank. Who has 45 pins on their harp that they're renting? I do. <laughs> on, your, on your Irish harp? No, not my Irish harp. No, so, so this is very many strings for an Irish harp. Plus seven, it's 52 in total, okay? So this is kind of outrageous. So these are the things to think about. Okay? So, so the first thing we do is, um, we've compared that to Irish harps, and there are these things that are different. So the next thing to do is to say, okay, Let's look further afield. Let's look for things that match this outside of Ireland and see how we get on. Okay. Ah, this is, I knew I needed my little black book for something. I'll have to make it up. So this is a book published in 1581 um, in Italy. And it's a very difficult book because he's writing an incredibly flowery, poetical Italian. He's, he's writing a book about music, he's describing harps, and he says, he's talking about Italian music, and he says, the harp comes to us from Ireland. Okay. Okay, and, he's, and he talks about the number of strings, and he says that they are Italian, if you read this. Uh, 54, 54, 54, 54, 54, 54, 54, 
Okay, 54. 50 pounds, I don't know what that is. It's 60. just per lambda, must be something like 60. Yeah, so he's counting numbers up, so it's 54, 56 or 7, 60. Yeah. Okay. How many strings did I say? How many pins did I say the coin have? 52. 52, so you know, we're trying to see between 9 and 10 pounds. So 54, 56, or even up to 60. Or even up to 60, yes. Okay. And, he, and then he says, the distribution of the chord of our half is the same. So the distribution of the chords, the chords of the Irish half, he's still talking about the Irish half. He, he got from a, uh, an Irish gentleman who showed him his half, and he says it's the same as on our half. It's the same as on the Italian half. Okay? And it, it's difficult to interpret, and people argue about this, but he's drawing a comparison between an Irish half he's seen and an Italian half. Yeah? Are you happy with that? Yeah, yeah. yeah it's very brilliant. <laughs> Anything I've missed? Uh, he's saying that the Irish harp apparently has the d double the number of chords that the Italian ones have. And the doppia di corde introdotte in Italia, so doppia means double, and corde is chords. And obviously, it's introdotte is introduced in Italy. So he's talking about the differences. So he's comparing the Irish harp you see with the Italian harp. Let's, um, let's zoom ahead for a for a minute, we'll come back to Italian hearts. Keep Italian okay, hearts in mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay. When you need me, call me. I'm in the wrong way. Okay, so here's Germany. Okay, this is a this is a book from 1618, 1620. So this is within five years of when the Cloyden mm -hmm. was made. In, this is in Germany. And on the left, well sorry, on the right, we have the ordinary harp. This is a Gothic grey harp, the kind of harp that Maura has here with her some of you will have seen, and I hope some of you will see later. Wait, have you done your masterclass with the Bray Hart yet? No. So, you see, today. So, so Maura is doing a masterclass on the ordinary harp, and, and if you're interested, you'll get a chance to hear its rather different sound and, and talk about those issues. So there's the ordinary harp, and on the left is the Irish harp with 43 very big, thick brass strings. 43 strings. Okay. Not as many as on the cloin, but more than on your harps. Okay. And then he describes here, he says, these are the notes that the Irish harp is tuned to. And so here we go. C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B flat, B, C sharp, D sharp, C, D. So, so there's this kind of jumble of, of notes suddenly appears in his, in his scheme. And it's kind of out of order, but basically, You've got all the sharps and all the flats and all the plain notes as well. Except not in the bass. Okay? The low B is perhaps a B flat, Simon. In German. Ah, yes, that's my that's my error. Thank you, Andrew. That's an error. I, I quickly transcribed it for you, but yes, this is B flat, not not B natural. Germans would write H for a B natural. B yes. Yeah. Okay. So let us continue. Okay, here we are in Denmark. Okay, this is 1622. So this is again within a few years of when the Cloyne Half was made. And what have we got here? Can anyone want to describe this picture to me? We've got a consort. Is it, so it's a group of musicians, yeah, all playing together. Yeah. And that what instruments have they got? Well, it's an Irish harp on the left shoulder. Yours to the you see the flute at the back. So you, have, so you have a flute, a lute, a bass viol, and, and an Irish harp. You will understand it's, an end, it's a front on view of the Irish harp, and he's tilted it over on his left hand side. He's got his left hand high and his right hand low. I think the artist was cheating. He didn't want to draw all the strings and everything. So he said, hold it this way. So, of course, this means we can't see how his harp's set up. But whatever the setup of this big Irish harp, he's playing really up-to-date continental consort music, yeah? This music is not like traditional Irish music, it's, it's, it's quite chromatic, it has, it has a lot of... That's and we've got lots of collections of music from this Oh yeah, lo so, yeah. loads yeah. of this music was written down, we know exactly what this music was like, that's, that's not a problem. And so there we are, so there, there's the Irish harp being used in this continental music, okay? And finally, here's James Talbot's manuscript. 
and he's in Cambridge in 1690. So this is a couple of generations after the Cloyne Harp was built, and he's He's describing Irish harps. He's describing all the musical instruments he's seen. He describes Irish harps, and he says the Irish harp has 43 brass strings. Again, it's a big number. And he says brass cheeks on each side of the neck. You, you know the brass cheeks on each side of the neck. In the upper cheek, 27 pins. Okay. In the upper cheek, 27. Where have you seen two rows of pins on a harp before? On the coin, the coin has seven in the upper. So talk which is casually says in the upper cheek, twenty-seven pins. Some harps have only one cheek, <laughs> like yours. Okay, so so this is interesting. And sixteen. Hmm. Twenty-seven and sixteen. What's his number? Forty. Forty-two. 42. 42. Well, he, he's describing more than one harp, and his notes are all getting jumbled. Yeah. So he talks about. I'm just trying to get a fifth. A sort of rough idea. Yeah. So you've got about 27 strings in one sheet, yeah. and so about 15 or 16. Yeah, yeah. Which sort of suggests yeah. the diatonics in one and the yeah, yeah. yeah, good. Thank you, Andrew. Okay. So I guess I guess the next thing to do is to look at looking more detail at the continental harp tradition. We've seen Irish harps on the continent. Now let's look at the continental traditions. So do you want to show off this Spanish and Italian harps very quickly? Sure. Remember, Galilei co compares. So, Spanish first. So, the earlier one that we see um, in Spain at the end of the 16th century is this kind of harp, the very large staved backed bottom, two rows of gut strings, and they're set up in this kind of X shape. So, your diatonic row is going this way. Thomas, and the chromatic row is going that way. Just, just, just keep chatting. All right, just keep chatting. Like, that sounds <laughs> a bit obvious. Um, <laughs> so your diatonic row, you oh can no. get at it with your bass hand end. Hang on, I should get my glasses on. And they, um, and you can get at the bass strings uh, in the diatonic row here, and also with your treble hand up here. So System two rows crossed over. Mm -hmm. um, Do we think the Spanish system went to Italy and then got? Well, I always assume that, that the Spanish harp went to the other bit of Spain, which was in Naples, yeah. because the Spanish, of course, were in control of it. It was a Spanish kingdom at Naples, because there's a, a, a nest of harping that shows up. In Italy around Naples. So, I don't know, what do you think, Andrew? I always Absolutely. think, I always think the two cannot be unrelated. Yeah. It well, must be that the Spanish went to Naples. When the harp appears further north in Italy, it's come from Naples. Yeah, everything and seems Naples. to go Spain, yeah. Naples, woof, everywhere else. Um, it's it's so, almost as if the Italians see yeah. the Spanish harp and go, ooh, chromatic, ooh, that's great. But of course, we, the Italians, we would come up with a much better system. <laughs> and so they don't go with this cross system at all, they go with uh, two or three. Firstly, two parallel rows, and then three parallel rows. Excuse me, what, what is the date of, of your Spanish? It's not a, it's not a historical facsimile, but they're, they're but starting to do that from the late 16th century. 
Yeah. So 15, 15 80s or something. So a generation, be a generation before, before this one? Maybe, it's know? described um, 1555. Yeah. Okay, so two or three generations yeah. before the cloying heart yeah. was made. Yeah. Um, but in 1581, uh, this gets, uh, uh, Galilei describes describes a padocchia, a, a double heart for the first time. This, so this is a, a large triple with three rows of strings. So um, the outside two are diatonic. <laughs> So yes. Talbot says some harps only have one cheek, it doesn't matter. You can have any arrangement you like at the top because on most harps, not Spanish, but on most harps you're playing near the soundboard. So it doesn't matter what the string arrangement is at the top. All that matters is what the string arrangement is at the box because that's where your hands are. Yes. And if you remember the picture of uh, Reinhardt Tin, uh, Tin where Darby Scott is playing that um, Irish harp in a consort, we can't see the strings, unfortunately, but we can see his hands. His hands are right down low. They're kind of pressing on the soundboard. Pressing on the soundboard. <laughs> so it, it doesn't matter what arrangement you have at the top. You can split the strings and make a, any arrangement you want on the soundboard, and that's what it's all about. So, so what's the implication of that for the cloying heart? What a pity that we have the we top. Have, that we don't have, have the soundboard. <laughs> we don't have we the all-important <laughs> arrangement of pegs that you've been seeing on the... Yeah. Those two I, th I think it was um, 
um, it was um, Mike and Bonnie who wrote this article That's right, yes. pointing out that from a single, whatever the stuff the arrangement is at the top, you could split this in interesting ways on the soundboard, and that's a really important thing to realize. Yes, this is, this is the May 1987 early music, and this was the first serious attempt to try and work out how the flowing harp works, and here's their diagrams, their speculative layout of what kind of pin arrangements on a on the soundboard might work. A little sketch giving you an impression of what they thought the flowing harp might have looked like. I don't think they ever made one though, did they? No. No. Th 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 but it was a very good sort of theoretical. Yeah, and there I, th this was the vital idea that sort of opened up. Yes, because, it, because, because everybody before had thought you have one row of pins, you have to have one, one row of pins. Yeah. And so Mike and Bonnie said, no, no, one row of pins splits to two rows of pegs, and then you can start having your diatonic line, your chromatic line. Uh, while you're looking at that issue of early music, that same issue has another article talking about the kind of music, the kind of consult music, that such an Irish kind of oh. might have played. So it's a very nice combination of articles in the same. Oh. And we have most of again. Right, no, let's bring it back to where we were. So we've looked at we've looked at our sources. Well, so let's look at the picture of Tim there. Oh yes, the picture of Tim. Board. Just no, after no way. And Andrew said about pressing. You, you keep going forward. I want to go backwards. Yeah. Yeah. That. yeah, I'm pressing that, but it's jumping forwards. Back, 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 back. That's the one. Yeah. See, see his his treble hands here. But look where he's got his bass hand. So, he's, so his hands are like this. It's, it's hard to tell in perspective, though. I mean, His hands are not like this. Well, well no, but, but he's low, but he's you can't low. tell how... Um, no, you can't tell how low, low but, he's, but he's low. That's yeah. the point. Okay. So, so um, we've looked at the Italian harp. We've looked at the Spanish harp. I just want to show you quickly two others. Can I just make a point about that? Yes. Um, can you go back to the picture again? Yes. What was interesting about that tone reduction? The lutenist is playing very near the bridge. Yes. And that would be a very, very um, sharp sound, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was so it, it may be that that, that, that is the sound that they're Yes, and if you play low on the strings, yeah. you get a snarly yeah. sound on the harp, yes. Most lute well, pictures show that. Yes. Yeah, but this, 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 this is new and outside film, isn't it? So it would be yeah, more, it would be more, more piercing. Yeah. Just the other idea. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, we've seen that. Okay, this is a this is a German Baroque harp, and it uses the Italian system, but it's not. It, the German ones don't have the triple rows; they they stay to the two rows that Andrew was talking about. And the other thing about the German tradition is they keep hold of the Bray pins. Again, see more as masterclass for this for this thing. So again, they're looking for that snarling, more aggressive kind of sound. So just to put that up there as a. As an, as the, there are lots of different. There are lots of different regional interpretations of this concept of rows of strings divided into a diatonic row and a chromatic row, so that you can mix through and play sharps and flats. Okay, and this is um, this is the British interpretation of it. Welsh harp makers in London um, took the Italian idea. The, the Welsh harpists play the same as we do left hand high, right hand low. So there's a problem if you try and play an Italian harp is that the sharps and flats are all in the wrong place. So the, Lon the, the London Welsh harp makers flip the whole thing so that you can play the, on the Italian system, left high and right low. And uh, you, can see, you can see the, the pairs of unison strings, the sharps and flats in the middle. And you can see that it singles out to the left hand at the treble on the right hand of the bass. And I love this picture, because look at the beautiful ornate gilding. It's rubbed away by his wrist. His right hand down here for the bass, and his left hand up there for the treble. OK. So, are we all happy about the wide context for the cloying harp? Have we got some ideas now about what you might do with those cloying fragments to turn them into a working instrument?
Yeah? You've, got you've got two rows of pins, you've got two cheeks. You've got a lots of wide regional variations on, the, on this concept of diatonic and chromatic strings in multiple rows that may or not be parallel or converging or crossing over. Yeah? Okay. So, so the next challenge is make a half and get it up and running. Okay. So there have been a few attempts at this. Um, perhaps for the first time ever we have two in the room. Um, but I first want to show you some pictures of other ones that we haven't got here. So you'll see this one on Tuesday. Okay, this was done in 1996 by Robert Evans and Guy Flockhart, his apprentice, working together as a team. And it was commissioned by the National Museum in Ireland. It was actually commissioned as a working instrument, which was, I think, rather ambitious. Um, they made it, they strung it, Bill Taylor came across from Scotland to play it, and there's so much string tension from those 52 strings that the soundboard split. And Guy, Guy Flockhart said, that's no problem, I'll make you a new sound, sound box, which he did. And the museum went, oh, amazing multi-thousand pound exhibit has just broken. I think we'll put it in a glass case and not touch it ever again. And so the poor thing had less than a year of being played before it got put in a glass case. And now it's not even in a glass case, it's in the store. But, um, but there it is. Well, it's in a very nice store. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's well looked after, but it's not on display. So the, there, was, oh, the neck, there was also a crack in the neck. Yes, the neck, the neck is... Well, you'll see the crack in the neck. Yeah, 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 but just so, to mention... So this, is, so this is the second sound box. Um, now, what have they done? They, they've got their row, main row of pins, they've got their second row of pins. Now, they have this idea that if you've got two rows of pins, you've got to drop them as two parallel rows of strings. So they made one big, long row of, pin, of, of shoes and a little side row of shoes for the seven extra. I don't think that's very practical, you know, so it was an interesting attempt. It was a great attempt to show what the harp looked like with its colours and with its decoration, with its gilded letter. Here we are, Ego Sum, Legina Kitharum. Here's the date, Anno Dom, 1621. And there's all these Latin mottos and Irish inscriptions and that kind of thing. But, so there we are, it's beautiful, but it doesn't really work. And having been made in the 1990s, it didn't take account of 1980s scholarship, because it didn't. Yes, they, they paid no attention to Mike and Bonnie's research. So, so it wasn't that, they didn't, that, that nobody had thought of other options, but they, yes. Anyway, it's very beautiful. Okay, this one belongs to Andrew, so tell us about it. So this was made in the late... 1980s, it was inspired by Mike and Bonnie's article and by the idea in the matching article in that same volume that you should play the music of William Laws on a chromatic Irish harp rather than a chromatic Italian harp. And um, we, we experimented a lot with it. We changed the setup on the soundboard many, many times. I don't know if you can see from there, but there's, there's lots of little holes here that have, that have been abandoned or filled in, so the shoes have been kind of shuffled all over the place. And there, there are a lot of constraints. I mean, you want to have enough chromatic notes that you can play it. Um, you want to try and have a string layout that you can get your fingers around. You don't want to have the complete compass of the harp be too much. If you don't have enough chromatic notes, you've got too many diatonic notes and the high notes will be too high to work and the low notes will be too low to work. So you're, you're, judging, you're messing around with all those things, plus you're messing around with the geometry of trying to get everything lined up. Because um, ideally you want the gaps between the strings to be kind of reasonably constant. And you want the strings parallel. And you want the strings sort of parallel when they come down to the, at least near enough parallel when they reach the soundboard. So there was just a lot of experimenting. We did quite a few recordings with it, um, I'd say that it's moderately successful in sound and moderately successful in playability, but um, still more experimenting is needed. I just want to say one last thing, which is kind of fun. Tim carved on it um, 
the king plays the queen of hearts. And can you all see? Again, it's a bit fuzzy, but can you all see? Here's here's a single Jupiter Pretorius with his with his diatonic bass, and then it became chromatic. Here's a single row of shoes in the bass, and then they start to zigzag for the for the diatonic and the shafts and flats. And here they swap over, changing sides, like Andrew was saying, for the earlier Italian style of harps. Yeah. So this shows you the kind of kind of layout that's, that's possible. Oh, and the box is carved from a single piece of willow. Okay. This is um, this is the harp that Tristram Robson made. When was he making it? In the nineties. Yeah, that's why he's here too. This is Tristram's thesis that we have here in the library. If anyone wants to read about the construction of this harp, there's lots of pictures of it, half made. Um, because of the tension of all the strings, the sound box broke. So what you see here is the second sound box. Did did, did yours break, Andrew? At all? No, no, it didn't. Yeah. yeah. Perhaps, that, perhaps a unique example of a flying heart not breaking. So far. Okay. This is Tristram here. Some of you will have met him two years ago when he came over to the summer school. And um, shortly before he died. And he left the society, his library, and his heart. So this is Tristram's heart that we have here. So this is the one in the photo. So you can see. Yes, do you want to show that? So Tristram was partly trying to reconstruct the Cloyne Harp, but trying also to develop it further, I suppose. So he has, show, show, the, show the cheeks. How, how many cheeks on the harp here? Three. So he's been rather ambitious, and he's made three cheeks, yes. So he has the idea of the, sep of the seven extra that the Cloyne has, but he's also zigzagged the pins. And the of more strength. He hasn't, no, I haven't counted, no. Forty? Sixty. Sixty strings on this harp, okay? So, it, so Tristram's been expansive and, and, and experimental. And if you can show us the shoes on the, on the front, so you can see what he's done, start from the bottom. Uh, he's been, he he ha doesn't have a diatonic bottom, do you see that? He's, he's taken the chromatics all the way down. And then what happens in the middle? He's got the two rows, the pairs of diatonic strings with the sharps and flats in the middle. And then as you go up, it singles out. Yeah. Anyone notice anything about the singling out? Which side is it on? On the right side. On the wrong side, yeah. Because of course Tristram was a, also a modern harpist and so so he plays with his right hand high. Um, Andrew's harp singles out on the wrong side because Andrew <laughs> plays right hand high. And, um, Bob Evans' harp doesn't single out because it doesn't have the two rows. How thick is the soundboard there? Oh, oh incredibly thick. thick. Because this is the second and he was scared. Yeah, was How many? You can see, here, here's the glue joint between the front and the back. Yeah. An inch perhaps. An inch, inch thick, the soundboard, yes. Yeah. Soundboard. Very thick, very thick. Yeah. Oh, Simon, could you say one last thing? The box, since we don't have the original box, I should say that the box on mine was, let's say, inspired by the Apology box. Yes, well, Tristram's box is inspired by the Fitzgerald's still there. So you look at, you look at the surviving halves, mm -hmm. and it's obvious what the box should look like, kind of. You can see the thickness of the side. But, it's, but the it's not side. obvious what the layout of strings on the front. That's the key thing, you know? It doesn't really matter the exact width. Depth, it's the, the zigzag. The okay? And then most recently, it's the harp that uh, David Courtier made. Now, this started about eight or nine years ago when David was in Ireland. He was delivering a harp to a client, and we met him, and we talked about two things uh, at Siobhan's house when we met him. The first thing we talked about was would it be possible? to commission somebody to make affordable student versions of early Irish harps. And you see the results that they're all playing today. Courtier's, the, 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 the HHSI student harps that Courtier makes for us. And the second thing we talked about is how is it possible to reconstruct the Cloyne harp? And we had sort of brainstorming sessions, thinking about string layouts, referencing Mike and Bonnie's ideas. 
talk, thinking about Siobhan's work with the uh, Italian harps. Well, we, we, we should also rem remind people that I had the fun at that stage that one of my students uh, came from the uh, Fitzgerald Castle in Cork where that harp was built, because yes. Roisin Allen was my well, well, that was the student. And the original the, harp yeah. came from, from the yes. house of the, the Allen Terrain. So, so uh, yeah. Dave, Dave Cortier and I so went, we went to, to, to Cloyne to, to House, and there they have a fiberglass cast from the museum, original. And so Dave and I sat in the conservatory at the hotel with pieces of string, looking at string alignments. And so it was rather convenient yeah, we, that the people who owned that. Yes. Yeah, so, so there was a lot of early Irish There was a lot of excitement nine years ago about all these people coming together and talking about the coin. And I'd like to bring up that that it was Simon who came up with the idea of of being able to use. You didn't have to run the string down straight from the upper cheek, but you sure. could use the others. Yeah, yeah. That was your idea. So, 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 so there were ideas coming about, about this idea of a single mm -hmm. row. And, the, and the, one of the things that we thought was important, because um, how do you use that second row? Tristram's done it. The second row, the strings all fall in one line and spread out. On, on your half, you didn't use the second row. Yeah. Not in the photo there, but perhaps in another. <laughs> anyway, the, 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 um, Bob Evans and Guy Flockhart, they made the upper pins longer so that the strings fell parallel. And so we, would, we had a lot of thought about what happens if you run the strings down through each other. And if there's no pins in this, in this okay. cheek. So, uh, so, 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 so there was a lot of to and fro over the course of a year or two with Cortier about how he would work it. He made templates, he made mock-ups, but there, there just remained a little problem that somebody has to actually commission the instrument. And this is where Thomas comes in, because, uh, because, because he ordered a coin replica from David, and, and so the beast was born. So, so you see, here we have the, here we have the two rows of pins. This is the, this is the seven extra, and we, we run them over, so this is like a bridge pin, so all the strings come down, getting the strings very, very close together in the middle. But okay. I, I want, that's what I was trying to say, Simon came up with that idea as far as I know, right Simon, no one else so I'm trying sure. to run the string between yes. the lower. Yes, Simon, we think this is a very clever idea of yours. Yeah, it's yeah, enough, yeah, 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 enough, enough of that. Enough of that. <laughs> okay. so, so I said on the coin half, the pins are quite close together, and in the centre they get doubly close together. So show us the same board, Thomas. So here's the bottom end of these seven strings, and here's our doubled section, and here's the chromatics in between. And go down to the base. Okay, here it is singling out, and there it is just diatonic. Now, um, remember Pretorius talks, talked about the diatonic bass. Show us the bass pins, Thomas. Now, th now, there's a really interesting thing that happens about the tenth pin, and this is something that people, again, that I picked up on, that other people are kind of going to apply to it if too close. Okay, can you see there's a kind of kink? Here they are running close together. And then on this one, suddenly the angle changes and they shoot off. Okay, so what's going on there? Okay, Andrew's harp didn't have that kink. Um, Bob Evans and Guy Flockhart put the kink in, but ignored it and ran chromatics all the way down. And so we came up with the idea, yeah, this is Pretorius' thing. These are the diatonic pins, and then this chromatic section starts. And because the chromatic pins, there's more pins, there's more strings, the, the, increase in pitch is less, you need a different angle. It, that's an important point because having chromatics going all the way down really increases the tension on the harp because it's those bass strings put on the yes. poundage. So, so going single there is quite yeah. healthy for the harp. Okay. Is it a problem to have a diatonic bass in this kind of music? Okay. So, the, so, the, so the chromatic harp players at the back are all going... Mm -hmm. Absolutely you, fine. You, you retune. You retune, yes. Um, um, and we have this from the from the later living tradition of Welsh, of these Welsh harpists playing chromatic harps. They, they were retuning the diatonic rows all the time. When I said diatonic, I mean yeah. not to. So, so you can easily retune these bases if you want a sharp or flat there. 
but you're not usually using sharps and flats and naturals all at the same time. Anyway. It's yeah. probably worth noting that the lute players did the same thing. Retune their bases. They stop their bass strings, but they would just retune them as needed. Yeah. But it saves you retuning the whole harp, and it also allows you to play sharps and flats and naturals. So that yeah, was so what is so up into the treble, and, and uh, Dave seemed to add a bit in the treble as well. <coughs> so anyone, we, anyone notice anything about the singling out? Yes, it's on the. <laughs> it's on the wrong side. So, so I have yet yeah. to see a chlorine replica that that is set up the right way around. Well, he bought he this up for a right-handed right player because, yeah, because the customer plays. Yeah, the, the, yeah, exactly. And, a, and it's only natural that the, the people who play who can play a thing like this have experience playing Italian yeah, and, and Spanish harps, and, and they all play the Italian. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting that modern people who play the, the, the historical Welsh harps tend to have mirror image instruments as well. But there, there's not, there, I'm not sure there's anybody playing historical British music on the Welsh harps who has it set up the correct way around. But, well, but it's not that long ago that most early Irish harp players were playing the wrong way around as well, even on a single well, Robin Hugh Bowen switched to the left side on yes. his triple harp. Yes, although he doesn't play the historical stuff no, so much. No. Yeah. So yeah, there are traditional players who play left side. Can we see the craft of all? Oh yes, okay, and so, and so um, because of the tension of so many strings, the sound will broke. Okay, um, this, this one hasn't yet been replaced, but it's been expertly repaired. So yeah, show us expertly. the craft. <laughs> show, show us the craft, because this is interesting, you know, the, the, the coin harp. Breaks. This is. I, I'm taking this. You know, the coin harp breaks. This is a kind of fact of life that you have to deal with. It got down here all the way. Oh, I like your approach. Then. Okay. And so, and so, then you think, what do we have of the coin harp? We have the neck. We have the pillow. What happened to the sound box? It broke. <laughs> perhaps it broke. Okay. So, so perhaps there's something fundamentally. I, I not would also <laughs> like to point out that this is a prototype, and the yeah. box was made. Like the strip added there, it was just. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah. this is not a single one piece. This, 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 is the, this is the prototype to get the setup working right, yeah? Of course, it was never meant to be a concert instrument or even a player's instrument, yeah. and it turned out to be quite nicely, and so just a bit about it. So there is an. Oh, I thought, I'm sorry. <laughs> Actually, isn't it a one, one piece? No. It is not a one no. piece. No, it's a clue sound box. It was yeah. simply yeah. meant to, to get some information and to get some. Knowing of the harp and of the setup, <laughs> and, but it turned out quite nicely. When, when I speak about showing the crack, is because I think that we all agree that it's really fascinating to see how the harps break, because that's <coughs> equally important in yes. how they work. Yes. Oops. Sorry. Um, I, have, I have a thought that I'd like to add when I look at this. I'm thinking the idea of putting the metal band down the center strip. Yes. Which is good. maybe it. it it kind of makes sense instead yes. of all, all so the... There, so there are many possibilities. I'm suggesting that it's possible to, to instead of having individual string shoes, perhaps you just have an iron plate. Oh, 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 oh. Okay. Oh, wow. wow. Mm. That's, that's, that's fascinating. No. Shortly after breakfast. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't have eaten so much. It's a big man. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, what thickness is, is that strange? Oh, you can see that. Yeah. It's not. It's not super thick, like no, it's not. like Tristan's. It's and then on the, the which which helps the harp have a good voice. If you make it too thick, the voice yeah. is muted. Yeah. 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 You know, they always say instruments like this sound at their best when they're about to break. Mm -hmm. yeah. I once heard. Um, I once heard uh, instructions for tuning a banjo. You, you you turn the string until it breaks, and then you back off a little. <laughs> <laughs> No, so, but we are confident to get it right with the, with the real one. So, Thomas, do you want, do you want to um, demonstrate the notes on the half and I'll hold the, I'll project okay. the screen up, so get it up and running, and like you did with Siobhan. Okay. So we did, did a little tweaking. The uh, original idea was, as Andrew pointed out, the, important thing happens here on the soundboard. Uh, we see the string setup, it's a mixed one. Uh, um, it's some kind of a mixture between a do double row and a triple row because we have this triple row, short triple row here from 
G. So if we stay in the same place, stay in the same place so with both hands, if you can. Or, or, okay. So we have these uh, five uh, very prominent notes, C to G. One, if you want to like to know, uh, like to think about sisters, two Gs here. C to G uh, is a triple row. And, the, and there's going to be a semitone in between? And the semitones, all of all the semitones in between. <laughs> it's so weird. <laughs> yeah. So um, usually uh, the triple row is, uh, the, the purpose of the triple row is that you, you have to, in a single, in a double row setup, uh, there comes a time or there comes a place uh, um, you have to reach through the outer row to get to the no, to the to the string. So you can only play with one hand. And you can you can, but you can. It's a it's a not an um, easy thing to do. So it's more difficult to play if you have to reach through the strings to the outer row. So you have this uh, the triple row makes it possible that you play a, on the outer row a lot a little longer. So for the left hand up to G, that's quite okay for most of the literature, so you do not need to go, go further up with the left hand. And it's oh, the same. say bass and treble rather than right and left. Uh, okay, sorry, with the treble hand, uh, the bass hand, you have to, okay, so. Yeah. Um, but you can, and the same thing with the right hand, uh, the treble hand, you can go down to C. That, that I have to say, I, I play in the, uh, mm. Um, on the left row a lot, sometimes with the lute lit literature I have to go. You mean you play on the, on the on, on the, on the Not on the chromatic, but I have to reach through the chromatic row to get to, to, get the, to the diatonic row, because the lute uh, usually, yeah, it's very, it's in the... C, yeah, C is a good C. So, so actually the treble hand doesn't go down as far as the pitch that we have our sisters on. Yeah, no. Only to, no, only to middle C. So, but there has to be a compromise. And yes. that little tweaking uh, still, and we have, I omitted the C sharp and D sharp in the high, the high, highest notes and put it on the bass. So I need, uh, I, I need a lot more often the C sharp and the D sharp here <coughs> in the bass. And so you run the chromatics a little bit lower than I the king. I a little bit use. lower than the king, and I even put here, uh, Last, uh, I've been played the downlands. I need the B flat in the. Here we have the B flat. So I. So you see, this is the section the court here has uh, made a single. A rank. single, single row, and uh, I play a C. We have we tuned a C, D, and then an F, omitting the E. Yeah. And then the G, A, and then B flat, D, because you often you use this B flat D in the bass. Mm. So you can, it's possible to retune, but um, okay. Uh, uh, it's better to have a go, in my opinion. But that's, I think it's some long, uh, a little tweaking. Well, it was Tristram's opinion as well, yeah. so he ran the chromatic section. Yeah, so, but I, I, we had tr I try to get along with what I have here, what I found here, and you have always the possibility to, to do uh, inline chromatics here on the, on the bass and retune it, and I think that was the practice. Um, Let's say yes. yes. yeah. Okay. So, but in a so for me, when it comes to the end, it has to be a working instrument to play the dedicated repertoire, and that like something we could discuss about what's the dedicated repertoire for that kind of part. That would be very interesting for me also. I try to play some Dowland, obviously, some lute pieces some, of the. Give us some examples, and then we'll okay. chat afterwards about other possibilities. Let's hope it's still in tune because it's a very tricky to keep it in tune. I don't know if it's a problem of the crack or of the setup but in general.
Very good, thank you. So, so what was that? Uh, Lacrime. By Tyler. Or as you know it, perhaps I... Uh, so, so this is a, this is a, the date of this would be? Well, 16... 1620, so the time of the cloy, and um, this is written now in full for... 59. 59 is already, but it was played a lot, a lot longer. And, uh, and this is written now in full for lute. Yeah. It's a lute piece. Yeah. There are many versions of this piece. Yeah. It's the most right. famous piece that John Dyer composed. There's a lute song version, there's a viral concert version, there's, there's lots of versions. Okay. So we're, we're running short of time, but we ought to talk a little bit about a great example, I think, of the kind of repertory that was around at the time that is suitable for a half is but what, any, any other thoughts on suitable repertory or <coughs> unsuitable repertory? There's a, there's a marvellous for Andrew, you know, I'm sure, um, a piece by, oh, one, one of the Pithuela composers, um, and in, in the manner of the Ludovica, uh, Ludovica, um, a, a, a play on the Pithuela, um, lots and lots of chromatics and things, and, and ringing strings. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yes, of course. What was it called? I can't remember. That's his, yeah. That, that's the, the style of Ludovico. That, that's Milan. the one. And Ludovico is a harp player. Yeah, yeah, but that's all in Spain, and so I think it translates very well for a Spanish harp. But the big repertoire for this instrument is the William Knowles harp consoles. Mm. And um, there was a lot of debate about this in the 1980s. And um, um, who's, who's the researcher who's been back in? John Cunningham. Uh, John Cunningham. John Cunningham has returned to the fray, and basically, um, amongst musicologists, the debate has finished. Musicologists are absolutely certain that the William Laws harp consoles are to be associated with an Irish harp, obviously a chromatic Irish harp, rather than an Italian side. How can the debate be concluded? Yeah, that's that's Read John Cunningham. And I, and I should say as well that, um, that Tristram's thesis was in two parts. One part was making of the harp, and the second part was a complete edition of the William Law's harp consorts to be played on that well, harp. Well, there are other pieces at the time that mention Irish harp. Barbara yes. Pearson's Grave Motets, which he publishes, actually says for want of organs, this can be played you know, on an Irish harp. And you can see why it's the same function yes. as an organ. It's a very sustained, sustained yeah. sound. So I think we should be thinking about, think of the sources I showed you for where Irish harps were, being, were known with chromatic strings. So Ge organ Germany, Denmark, England presumably, and also in Ireland because the cloying harp was made in uh, East Cork. Yes. <laughs> and it has all these inscriptions on it in Irish. So the cloying harp is presenting itself as a very Irish instrument, but it's not for playing Irish music, it's for playing... The continent, the, well, the sure foreign style. Irish, wasn't Sorry? Sure Irish, wasn't yes, but I'm, not sure, I'm not sure Darren's music is Irish music. <laughs> and then also some <laughs> Irish gentleman who's visiting Italy yes. in the 1580s. Yeah, Sean yeah. Donnelly thinks he knows who that is, and I keep forgetting the reference. Mm. Sean Donnelly has sort of put two and two together and said, oh, yes. it must be this person who's coming. Well, we, we, should, we should mention Donatus Achain as well. Yes, mm. I tried to get into that. What, what's his um, date? Uh, 16 something something, I don't even remember. I think it's early 1600s. There's an yeah. Irish harp I recruited in London for the court of for the, for the royal court. Of I actually tried to dig into that. And um, so the thing we have is the letter for the person who was supposed to recruit him with the name of Donatus Catton Donatus uh, uh, mentioned in it. And it's for the court of Prince um, Kazimierz. In, in Poland, in Warsaw. Unfortunately, I haven't reached any mentions of him actually arriving there or being there. And I've reached a person, the professor who wrote the thesis on, Poly on musician on, <coughs> on Polish court, and he knew about the Natus Katon, he knew about the letter, and when asked him, do you have anything more, he said, well, it's all in my book, and I'm not taking care of that anymore. So, unfortunately, I can only read his book and but, see. But an Irish harper in London in the 1620s-ish, he recruited to serve in the Royal mm. Court of what I assume that this is the kind of thing that they were playing, this is the kind of harp they were playing. And in Rembrandt's pictures? Maybe. But certainly Irish harp. Whether mm. They, they might be stage props, though. Anyway, um,
um, to conclude, what's next? Nothing. This, uh, this, is, this is not the finished result, is okay, it? No, 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 that's not. Um, okay, it was a prototype, and I think it, it's working well. It, you can play it, right? <laughs> Uh, which is not an, such an easy thing to do, but everyone is invited to try yeah. to play the harp and see uh, it's a little different to the usual setup. Um, but I, I think it works well uh, with this loop repertoire. Um, you have a good sound, it doesn't break too badly. So <laughs> I, I never heard it play, so I, I think uh, I would be delighted to hear it played from this, so, so I can get the, some. Uh, impression how it sounds for an audience. <laughs> um, and next is that uh, the David is making uh, just um, as we are speaking he's carving all the nice elements <coughs> here the, for the real one you know. Uh, uh, sorry but it's also set up right playing yeah. with travel hand and right. But Black Park. <laughs> <laughs> Don't apologize but it encourages him. Okay. <laughs> So uh, I think the, the goal was ever, anyway, or the, uh, the purpose was always to make a, a copy uh, comparable, or oh, I hope even better. Than so painted, decorated, painted, decorated, with, decorated the with a uh, gray, uh, with a real sound, one willow, one sound one box, yeah. willow sound box, so <laughs> the real thing, so, but playable in a way, and that's why we did the prototype, and the prototype, I think it sounds good, nice. okay. Uh, it's in 4.15, it sounded a lot better in 4.40, but it broke on 4.40, so I will try it, I want to try to bring it up to a little higher pitch, so but if the sound really improves if it's a little higher. I, I got the, who's interested in the string tensions, we're around 10, 12 kilos <coughs> per, per string on 4.40, and we are now at 9, and so 9 and 10, so... Um, but it still has a good sound. It still has a good sound, but it's, it, was a it sounded a lot right and more volume, more resonant uh, when it was a little pitch, a little bit higher pitch. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, uh, we go f and went for the Kildare sound box, that, because it's obviously the problem which sound box to choose, but I think uh, the Kildare is a quite, mm -hmm. is a very sensible choice. Well, like I said, the, the shape in the, of the sound box is less yeah. important than the Ziggy Zags, and I think, yeah. I think you'll agree that this works. Yeah. yeah. So, and I hope that in a year from now we have... This, I, I would say this is the first one that actually reproduces the exact layout of the neck of the clone mm -hmm. and works. So yeah. there are others that work but have changed the neck orientation. There are others that have reproduced the neck and don't work. This one, the, this one, this right. one, this one is a replica of the clone neck and it works. I think that's, that's quite impressive. Uh, it's our first step. We hope to, I hope to go some that's steps great. further okay. in playing and... So we're late for tea break, so um, get yourself some tea, but during tea break and practice time, I'm sure. And, and can we just say thanks to Thomas for yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Thank you. 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 Thank you.